summer concerts, pool parties, chill nights under the stars. We're stocking up our closet so you're ready to look your best for all of it. At Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston, we're buying all things summer. So bring in your tees, tote bags, sandals, sunglasses, and more. We pay cash on the spot for gently loved name brand looks. Plato's Closet is the go-to destination for trend-forward teens and young adults who support local and shop sustainable. Visit Plato's Closet today. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. So you might have heard tell the old phrase, it's the economy, stupid, came from the Clinton era back in the 90s, but it really does have a lot of truth to it. The economy is one of those things that while the terms and the ins and outs of it are very complicated, folks know how much they're spending, what things cost, whether life is good or not for them economically. It's something that really affects everybody. And that's why it gets really, really noisy in our news cycle. And right now, our news cycle is all kinds of noisy with noise over the economy. People are worried about it. They're worried about inflation. They're worried about the hangover effects of COVID-19. They're worried about the supply chain. And these things are very complicated. So what's noise and what's good information? We're going to turn to a friend of ours, uh, Abby Hall Blanco. She's a professor of economics at Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky. She has all kinds of accolades and work that she's done on this subject. And she really knows how to explain these things. So we're just going to ask her, what should we worry about? What shouldn't we worry about? Where do we get lost in terminology and start forgetting about how these things affect people? These are all things that we need to understand when we're looking at the news cycle. So what we always pride ourselves on doing here on Hertel, we're going to turn down the noise on economics and talk to Abby Hall Blanco and just ask the questions and see what we do need to worry about and what we don't need to worry about and what we need to be looking at ahead of time going into an election year where the economy is going to be at the top of a lot of people's minds and probably going to show up on people's ballots. She's also done some work in an issue that's not getting talked about a lot, migration. Now in America, when we talk about migration, everybody wants to talk about the Southern board and immigration and the 40 year mess of policy that has been here in the States. But overseas, immigration and migration is becoming a very big issue. And it's been a geopolitical, I'm going to call it weaponized. It's being used purposefully to try to affect world events. We're going to ask her about her work on that, and she's going to explain it. We're also going to talk a little bit about the lingering after effects of Afghanistan. Folks have already forgotten and stopped talking about the mess that was Afghanistan. Uh, Abby Hall Blanco has co-authored two books on militarism and things like this, especially how propaganda affects how we view things like the military, like overseas policies, like the war on terror and Afghanistan. We got a little bit of space from it. Last time I talked to her was actually when Afghanistan was kind of falling apart. So let's get her views since then. Since folks are kind of forgotten about it and stopped talking about it, we want to bring it up again because it still matters. It's still important. We spent 20 years there, a lot of blood and a lot of treasure. What do we have to show for it? Did we learn any lessons? And what is the lesson of the fact that the American public has already mostly forgotten about it? We're going to talk about all these issues with Abby Hall Blanco right after this on this edition of Turd Tale. And I'm thrilled once again to get a talk to Abby Hall Blanco. 
uh, who's super sharp. And last time we talked, we were actually doing live radio on a really, really bad day. So this will be a little lower speed. But how are you, my friend? How you been doing? I'm great. How are you? Good, good. Uh, let's just start with your bailiwick. You are an economist. Uh, as we previewed you, you talk a lot about propaganda. You talk a lot about how the government functions versus how the government presents itself. The economy is on a lot of people's minds. Uh, they talk about terms like inflation and things like this to get in the media. But where, where do you tell people? Because everybody knows what you do in your life, I'm sure. I'm sure they would reach out to you and be like, hey, explain this to me like I'm five because I don't understand this. Uh, how much of what we're seeing about the economy is just abstract panic? How much of it is cause for concern? Is there a propaganda element to some of this? Kind of, kind of steer us a little bit just to kick off today. Where should we actually worry and where should we be like, no, that's noise. Let's turn that down and get to the information on what's actually going on in the economy right now. Sure. So I'll try to give the answer that my dad always asks for. So um, my family will ask questions of what's going on with insert topic here. And right. my dad will then follow that up immediately with the short version please, um, because it's not always not always easy to do. So um, I think one of the big things that's on people's minds right now is what's going on with inflation. So people have been hearing that prices are rising. And if you've done any kind of grocery shopping or anything like that, chances are you're probably feeling it in your wallet. I know that I am. So inflation is a complicated issue. Um, it caught some economists flat-footed. It did not catch other of us completely off guard. The big question that's being asked right now is, are these price increases? And when we talk about inflation, by the way, we mean about what's happening to all of the prices. So if all prices are generally going up, that's inflation. Because um, we're used to prices bouncing around all the time. But inflation is talking about all of the prices taken together. So the big question is, is the inflation that we're currently experiencing, is it transitory? So is this something that is going to get better over time? Or is this something that's going to be uh, sticking around for a while? And that question remains to, to be determined. Um, there is some argument that some of it at least is transitory. Um, part of that relates to the fact that you have people who are wanting to spend, they're wanting to buy stuff. So they've got this like pent up uh demand because they've been locked down for almost two years at this point. And then we also have these supply chain issues. So there aren't enough goods and services to keep up with this demand. And then you've got this um, kind of perfect storm for higher prices. So if those supply chains eventually catch up and there's some expectation that they will at some point, um, then we might expect to see prices going back down. However, you have to consider things like what's been going on with the Federal Reserve. We've been printing tons of money over the last couple of years. Um, and when you use the printing press, then we oftentimes see that inflation follows that type of monetary policy. So I would pay attention to, to that. Um, other things people are giving a lot of attention to right now are oil reserves. So what's happening to uh, oil and natural gas prices, which is something to be cognizant of. Um, and then something else that's popped up on a couple of feeds, uh, apparently maple syrup. They're also <laughs> tapping into reserves, too. So, yeah, blend Canada, right? When all else fails. <laughs> um, what is it? Because people talk about it, that this kind of started as a supply side inflation issue. You're an economist by trade. Uh, I am I know the supply side a little better because I'm a transportation guy by trade. Uh, there's a lot of truth to that. COVID was a unique uh, event because it was worldwide and it came in waves because it hit different parts of the world at different times. What is something that folks can look at that says, OK, yeah, this was a supply side issue to start with, but the way we're reacting, the way we're handling it, whether it's government policy or public panic or whatever, where would be the tipping point where this would go from a supply side inflation or a supply side problem to we've made this worse and now we're dealing with a full blown inflation event or whatever the proper terminology for that would be? So I don't know that there's necessarily like a, a tipping point where if you're on one side of it, then you have this scenario and this road that you're going down. Or if you're on the other side, there's there's another road. Um, I think that there are a couple of different things that people can look at. As economists, we look at both the supply side and the demand side of the equation. So um, looking to see things like, um, you know, what, how many ships are sitting docked off yeah. of yeah. the California coast 
waiting to be unloaded. That's something that we can look at looking for supply chain issues. Um, we also look at things like consumer sentiment, consumer confidence. We know how much people are spending, especially right now with the holiday season. People are going to be really interested in paying attention to how much people are spending in the retail sector. So I think there are a couple of different things that we could look at. One thing that I'm always encouraging people to do if they want to know what's going on out in the economy is to take a look at what is going on in terms of policy. So what we're seeing right now um, is what are called like lagging effects or sometimes system effects. So oftentimes when we talk about policy, we don't appreciate really, or at least it's difficult to appreciate that sometimes the outcomes or the consequences of these policies aren't seen until 12, 18, 24 months down the road. And so things that were implemented a year, year and a half ago that we've all kind of forgotten about because we're busy doing other things, some of those consequences are now what we're actually seeing in addition to um, things which are going on related to contemporary conditions. You talk about it, uh, the lag time. It's part of the problem when we discuss economics, especially in America and our current media environment, that we don't understand that there's a lag time, that we don't understand it like, yeah, we have a president, but he's been president for roughly a year and there was a guy before him. And then the guy that was before him had a guy before him. They have lag times. There's there's a lot of this who gets caught in what chair at what time. Is that part of the problem when we discuss economics is we just kind of look at that national political scene and we don't understand it. Like, look, there's waves and layers and nuances to these economic problems that don't fit into our news cycle just perfect. And then people don't get the information on the economy that they really need to kind of make good decisions about things like holiday spending or like planning for next year when something that happened 18 months ago is going to affect the second quarter of next year and things like this. So I think that there's definitely part of that. Um, one of my areas of research is what's called public choice economics or the economics of politics. And one of the things that we talk about within that body of literature is exactly what you mentioned, is that sometimes who gets caught kind of holding the bags is who happens to be there at the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas, as you point out, sometimes it's not the person who actually is currently sitting in the chair that is the person who implemented the, the policies. Um, there are a variety of different factors that people can look at. Some of them are within the control of policymakers. Some of them are out of control of uh, policymakers, regardless of how much we would like to think that the policymakers are in control of some of these things. Um, and so there's there's definitely some of that. Um, one of the other things that I always point out to people, too, is that when we talk about um, the economy, there's not you can't master like economic understanding in in all areas. So right. when people are like, I'm really confused about what's going on right now, like I'm opening um, I'd say a newspaper, but no one reads newspapers anymore. <laughs> like I open my email inbox in the morning or I turn on the TV and I just don't understand all of the things that are going on. Um, and it's totally understandable because uh, we as professional economists are trying to make heads and tails of a lot of the stuff that, that's going on right now, too. And so understanding any particular issue, whether you're wanting to look at inflation, if you're wanting to look at the supply chain, if you're wanting to look at um, COVID policy or whatever type of policy that you want to look at, all of these things have different economic implications of them, and they are all in their own right remarkably complicated. Yeah. One of those complicated things that's gotten a lot of attention, and you can just explain this to me like I'm five because I don't understand it either, even though I've read a lot about it, is when somebody sees something that just in the common language and the common vernacular just doesn't make sense or it seems incongruent to them, for example, and this is one of the ones that's really been driving a lot of the narrative on economics lately, how do you have a low unemployment rate but have a labor shortage at the same time? Something like that just does not make sense to common people. I don't understand it, even though I've tried to read a lot about it. Everybody has an opinion on what it is, and, and, and we need to specify in a country as big as America, it's going to be different in different regions and different areas. But it's real. It's a problem. We have a low unemployment rate and a labor shortage. That shouldn't happen. How does that happen? How did we get to that? It, it does seem very confusing. And this is actually a question that I've been fielding a lot from, from students, from family, from who, you know, from people like yourself of like, okay, how do we get this scenario <laughs> where um, I was in McDonald's the other day getting a cup of coffee and the poor woman behind the counter was running around trying to work the drive-through window and talk to people in the back and work the counter. And 
you know, she, I told her, I was like, you look busy. She's like, we don't have enough people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how, when you have a, again, unemployment rates been, been dropping, um, and yet you have all of these people who are, um, hiring, like, how do you, how do you have this? It seems really incongruous. And one of the things that we are seeing, we anticipate seeing, and I'm sure a lot of people will be doing more research about this, is what's called structural unemployment. And so one of the things that we have seen happen is that sectors where people used to be working, so think things like retail, think things like food service, those jobs were always really reliable, but those jobs are often really, really difficult. The pay has typically been pretty low in those types of jobs, Um, but those jobs were always there. Then you have something like the COVID pandemic, you have restaurants that get shut down, you have retail stores that get shut down. And so those jobs that appeared to be relatively secure and also relatively low risk Mm -hmm. no longer appear low risk because now if I'm working at a restaurant, I'm around people all the time. Mm -hmm. And that looks risky. I'm not making a whole lot. So why would I want to have this job? Let me go do something else or let me go back to school and then I'm going to move into a different sector completely. So part of it is that some of these places or some of these sectors that are hiring, um, the workers are not interested in working in those particular sectors or the skills are mismatched. So it could be that the places that are hiring, the workers that are still available are not workers that have the skills to take those particular jobs. The other thing that people are looking at too is labor force participation, particularly among different groups. So there's a big discussion going on around, say, child care. So what child care options are available? Because in a lot of places, it's still incredibly limited, whether you're looking to try to find someone part-time, full-time, a nanny, daycare, whatever it happens to be. We've seen a big contraction in the number of people who are working in the child care sector. And so when you have people who are interested in going back to work, they can't find child care or that child care is very expensive, then people say, you know what, I can't afford it, or this is too hard, I'm just going to stay home with my kids. Mm -hmm. And so then you have people who are not entering the labor force or re-entering the labor force and instead electing to use their human capital or their skills at at home. So we have a few different things that are going on um, at once, and hopefully that might help uh, to explain a little bit of what's going on. So since you get that question all the time, including from people like me, you should have an answer to the obvious follow up question on when you're whether it's your students, uh, because you do teach economics or in your advocacy or when you're commentating or when you're just writing a piece or talking because you've been doing lectures and stuff. What, what do you tell people just just normal folks like, hey, here's here's where you need to go to get good in- economic information or good economic news because our current news media is not doing a great job of getting into something that's as complicated as economics because obviously they want to cover the cultural angle or especially the political angle and those sorts of things and they got three minutes for a clip or something like this where do you tell folks that like hey here's where you need to actually look at look at this uh pay attention to this type of thing in the economic sector or pay attention when these type of people start saying this? What, what is it you tell normal people to kind of cut through the noise? How do they get good economic information in, a, in kind of a practical way that everybody can actually use it? Well, to, for the record, most people are like, okay, that sounds really boring. And their eyes roll in the back <laughs> of their head and they have zero desire for additional follow-up. <laughs> but Fair um, enough. so in terms of looking at things like um, if you want just the raw data, and the raw number. So you want to know, okay, what sectors are hiring? What sectors are shrinking? Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics or the BLS is going to be your best place to go for actual data as it relates to unemployment. Um, that is, they said, just presented very matter-of-factly. So this industry added this many jobs, this industry lost that many of jobs. So if you're concerned about spin or how things are going to be interpreted, there is no interpretation. It is the, it's the raw numbers. Um, in terms of where I look, so that's probably the best way to answer that question. I subscribe to a few different uh, email newsletters that I get in my inbox every morning. Um, And so some of those are research related. Some of those are just general kind of what's going on out in the world. Um, And I purposefully get them from different types of news outlets so that I figure between the the two or three of them that I'm going to skim, they're all going to be talking about the same thing in slightly different different ways. Um, But I always feel like that's pretty helpful uh, 
as a means of getting getting a snapshot um, of mm. what it is that's going on because it can be really hard to separate through what's what's commentary versus okay what's what's actually happening. Since you brought it up, it's a good point. Uh, do you find kind of the the model changing a little bit for people that want to advocate on things like economics and things like this? The you know Substack and newsletters and and the modern media environment. Do you do you find that that's helpful? Do you think that's kind of breaking down maybe some of the gatekeeping where maybe folks only got to read two or three nationally known economists and that was it? Maybe do you do you think that's a good development for your chosen field that there's that ability for folks to kind of take a la carte information or do you find that that's kind of I don't know, maybe digitizing and making more noise than is necessary. How's it land with you that you get? Because obviously you get to do it too, because you're making media and you have your own way of doing it. But just overall for something like economics, that was kind of a niche is the wrong word, but it was definitely kind of specialized. Is that helping the general public or do you think it's just causing more confusion or what do you think? I think it's it's honestly probably a mixed bag. So I realize it's the most economist answer that I could give, which is that it depends. Um, <laughs> And so I, I think that for some people, it's probably really helpful because you get information that's distilled down and you can explore in more detail if you want. Um, one of the things that I have, one of the things that I have said, and I'm certainly not the only one, is that economics as a discipline is really interesting because people who are not economic experts nevertheless speak as though they understand mm -hmm. like an economist would. Um so for instance, like if I tripped and I fell and I, as I'm falling, like I go up into the air for a minute, I'm not going to be like, oh, hey, well, I was floating for a second. Therefore, the law of gravity is suspended. Right. Um, and yet sometimes people will say like, well, the price of something increased and I bought more. Therefore, the law of demand doesn't hold and your entire discipline is wrong. Um, and so there is something that happens when you have just a lot of people offering economic commentary who don't actually know a lot about what is going on in, in the economy. Um, and so from that perspective, I think that that might not be very helpful. Um, but also too, at the same time, like I don't want to point people and say, oh, you should only listen to economists because economists are the experts because there is, um, uh, there's definitely a, believe the, the phrase that other people have used is like, there's a tyranny there of like mm. always deferring to experts and the experts aren't, aren't always right. Um, so I think it's probably, it's probably a mixed bag. We have some things that are really good. It's helpful for people to get this information, to be interested, to look at things further. If these types of media help people do that, then I think it's positive in that way, um, but can also definitely have its own drawbacks in terms of what information are people getting? Is that information accurate? And then who's presenting it? Because everyone has their filter. Yeah. When you were talking about that, it, it made me remember uh, last year when we did the toilet paper run and people kind of learned, you know, economics on that level where after a week it fixed itself because people went, wait a minute, this is stupid. Let's just stop doing this. And it fixed itself as opposed to something like oil and gas prices, which, you know, is multi-layered goes through multiple regions of the world, lots of regulation, a very comp, one of the more complex economic programs. I, I just thought of that juxtaposition when you were talking about that as like, hey, when it really affects people, they can figure it out pretty quick. But then when it's something really, really complicated, they can just complain about it. But maybe they don't really have a good avenue to dig into something deep like oil and gas prices have a lot of complexity to them and a lot of lag. Yeah. I mean, and that's one of the things that you look at if you're talking about, especially you mentioned oil and natural gas, so you're talking commodity prices. Mm -hmm. These issues all get really complicated very, very quickly. Um, and I know people who they research what's called resource economics. So they study exclusively things like oil mm -hmm. and natural gas. They make a career out of it. And so it's perhaps not surprising that when people, I mean, even people like me, so I'm, you know, I'm a PhD economist, but I can look at oil and natural gas prices, but I'm still not going to have the same understanding as someone who, who is an expert in, in that particular field. So there's, it's a lot. Same thing if you're looking at the, the labor market, or if you're looking at issues related to defense or infrastructure, like all of these things have their own very specific areas of focus and their own issues, their own specificities that are important to understand if you really want to dig in, but probably for someone who's just wanting to get a cursory, cursory understanding may not be necessary or may just be um, overwhelming. Yeah. 
Well, economics is, you know, people behavior turned into numbers. Let's turn some numbers back into people. You've one of those areas of expertise you've been talking about has been uh, migration. Now, in America, when we talk migration, people automatically start thinking about the southern border. And that's important. Obviously, it's been a hot button issue for you know 40 years now. Uh, but overseas migration has taken a very ugly turn, not just in the human cost, but it's really becoming a geopolitical issue. And it's become, and I've used this term, and you can tell me whether you like this term or not, uh, migration has become weaponized overseas in a lot of cases. And you've been doing a lot of lecturing and talking about this issue lately, not just the economic uh, impacts of it, but the people impact of it. What are you seeing overseas that's so concerning that's starting to show up on people's radars when it comes to migration, especially in Eastern Europe? Uh, we're seeing it in the channel now between France and England. Uh, what got you interested in that as kind of a side to what you've normally been studying anyway? Yeah, so there are a few different things that are going on. Um, and one of the things that people often think about, and I know that especially to being in the U.S., it's easy to it's, it's easy to be U.S. centric living yeah, here. And yeah. so. Oftentimes, you're right. When people talk about immigration, they automatically think, oh, the United States, the U.S. southern border, everyone wants to come to the United States. But actually, if you look at where people are interested in going, the U.S. is just one of several different destination countries that people are ultimately interested in going to. So you see a large percentage of people who would be interested, if they could, in moving to Spain or in moving to Saudi Arabia. And you can think about maybe which groups might be interested in, in countries like that. A um, few different places that we can look at now in terms of thinking about migration and particularly like the crises surrounding migration. So there is that discussion of the U.S. and the U.S. southern border. Some of my contemporary research with a couple of colleagues um, is looking at that issue in particular. Um, but if you want to go into South America, so even further south, mm -hmm. you can look at what's going on with Venezuela right now and the number of immigrants who are trying to leave Venezuela and going to places like Colombia. Um, but then the place where people are really focusing on right now um, is what is going on in Belarus. And mm -hmm. so particularly looking at um, what it is that the government of Belarus is doing and the what people are calling, um, you use the term weapon, like weaponize, um, I think definitely political tool is, is appropriate. Um, and so trying to use uh, immigrants and migration crises as, as a political tool. Um, and so there's a lot of tension that's being paid over there right now, particularly the implications for uh, the European Union, um, but then also, as you mentioned, the humanitarian cost as well. Why, why is it that um, migration has become that, especially in Eastern Europe that we've seen a lot of, we saw this in Greece a while back. Uh, we've seen it in Turkey's having all kinds of problems. We see uh, part of the problems with Afghanistan was you saw countries like Russia was talking about like, hey, we don't want refugees and, and coming north. Why is it specifically becoming an issue there? Is it the EU becoming, you know, the dominant block in there? I know there's untoward actors like the Erdogan's and the Putin's of the world that will use anything for power. So this is obviously just another thing. What is it that's really driving this all of a sudden? Because it seems like the last five, 10 years, this is getting worse and it's getting controlled is the wrong word, but it sure seems like it's getting specifically aimed at certain pressure points in the greater geopolitical discussion, doesn't it? Okay. So I'll start, I'll start with that very broadly. So yeah. what, what is it that about migration that makes it such like a hot button issue? And then I'll narrow it down and I'll talk more specifically about what's going on in the in Eastern Europe right now. So when we look at immigration as an issue, and this is not anything that is new, right? So if you want to take it back to the United States, like you can look at legislation throughout the U.S. history that is targeting specific groups of people. So whether it's trying to keep, you know, Chinese from immigrating, if it's trying to keep people from Central and Latin and South America from immigrating. There's there's lots of different examples of this throughout history. So it's not anything that's new. Um, if you look at the typical concerns that are raised about immigration, so you'll typically see things about um, wages, the use of social services, crime, um, other kinds of like integration or assimilation concerns, and things like that. And um, the literature is overwhelmingly clear that those are not uh, 
not issues of particular concern. So like immigrants don't depress wages. They don't lead to increases in crime, things like that. Um, the data on that is really, really clear. Um, so in terms of like historically, why do we see this? Um, it's really easy to scapegoat uh, another group. So you define people into like in groups and out groups. Um, it's very appealing to be able to say, no, 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 like these problems aren't anything to do with me. Like the problems are these other people who don't look like me, don't speak the same language as I do. They're the ones causing all these issues. So from a historical perspective, that's kind of what we're looking at in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and we can dig into details on any of those other finer points in terms of like wages or crime or anything like that if, if you want. But like I said, the literature on that is really, really strong and very, very clear. Um, in terms of what's going on in Eastern Europe right now, so focusing in on Belarus. So Belarus's current president is a man by the name of Alexander uh, Lukashenko. So Lukashenko has been in power since 1994. Um, and after the 2020 elections, um, there was uh, a discussion about, and I use discussion in air quotes, um, their discussion about whether or not he might have actually won that election. Um, it wasn't the first time there's been a discussion about whether or not he actually won the election. Um, and after this, what you see is that the uh, European Union um, imposes sanctions on Belarus. Um, you add on to this issues in terms of like forced repatriation. And then you look at the um, Ryan Aaron 4978 incident. So people may not remember this, um, but this was back in, I think, May. Um, you have a flight. There is a false bomb threat. Um, they force this plane to divert to land in Belarus. Uh, there is a Belarusian journalist on board who was very critical of the Lukashenko uh, regime, I think is an appropriate term to use. Um, it's diverted as a result of this bomb threat. He's arrested along with his girlfriend. This leads to additional condemnations, some additional sanctions and things like that. So this is what's going on in the background. So you have Belarus, who is being backed by Turkey and Russia, although they both deny that they are involved with this. Of course. Um, but we're you know, relatively <laughs> confident that, in fact, they, they, have, they have a dog in this fight. Um, and so back in July... Lukashenko threatens to, the, I think the word he used was flood um, the European Union with uh, refugees, particularly with trafficking, with armed immigrants and things like that. So what you have now is, or what you've been seeing, is you have these various like tourist agencies, again, air quotes there, that are enticing or trying to get migrants primarily from places like uh, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, but also places, uh, other places in Africa. You have some folks from Russia there as well. These different Belarusian agencies who are trying to pull migrants to the Belarusian border, primarily with Poland, but elsewhere too, and then giving them, or it's been reported, giving them things like bolt cutters and stuff like that to try to help them get across the, the border. So this is, as you pointed out earlier, immigrants really being used as a geopolitical tool. Um, so what's Lukashenko trying to do? I mean, he's trying to cause problems for, for the European Union. Um, and you can think about what some of those problems might be in terms of you have human beings who are now on your border, you're trying to figure out who they are, what they're doing, um, and all of the types of resources that you're going to have to expend in terms of trying to contend with severe unrest uh, along one one of your major borders. Um, but there's also been discussions too about migrants, um, you know, being tear gassed or um, otherwise suffering like inhumane treatment. There's a lot of human rights concerns about whether these individuals have access to, you know, clean water, even things like sleeping bags, things like that. Um, so that's kind of what you've got going on in in Belarus, but it's certainly not unique there of this being a an, an issue. And an undercurrent of this, besides the politics, uh, you are an economist. This is what you talk about. How how economically stable is the EU right now? We know the UK left. 
Uh, we know Germany's shouldering more of the load than ever before, and Angela Merkel is passing off the scene, I think, this week, if I'm not mistaken, now that the new government's formed. So that, that's a lot of stability for 16 years passing off the scene. Uh, economically, because this is an economic pressure, like you said, threatening with migrants and refugees, how stable is the EU, just economically speaking, not just politically, from, from what you've seen? So I'll have to I'll have to honestly punt on that question sure, mostly because sure. um, I'm I'm frankly not not an EU expert um, and so it's not my my area of focus. There's there's been a lot of discussion around what has been happening with the EU. So you mentioned you know Brexit as as an example. You have these issues that are going on in Belarus. You have the you know the Russian question that's like always kind of looming large off you know, off to the east of what what's Putin doing. Um, And so I think it'll be interesting to see with Merkel departing if that does have um, have a major impact or or not. Um, There's always discussions about, you know, the European Union in terms of being on a central currency. So you saw that several years ago with, you know, the debt bailouts for Greece and the like. And so uh, I don't know ultimately what this will mean for the the European Union and, like I said, it, Merkel in in particular, um, exactly how how much of a stabilizing factor she's been. And I'm sure it will change, but I I couldn't I couldn't guess to say exactly how at this point. All right. I, I always appreciate people that just say I don't know. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, for um, sure. Because that that's actually my whole being for doing all media is I don't know. I'm going to ask the question and see if I can figure it out. So no, it's just anytime you have that much stability changing, good, bad, or indifferent, there there's going to be a changeover. And um, and I'm a little biased because I lived in Germany two different times, so I I kind of try to pay attention to what's going on over there. But when when we talk about things, I think sometimes as Americans we talk about oh. Putin's bad and Turkey's acting up. And we, we think these things are in vacuums and it's just bad guys over there and they're not. There's economic undercurrents to these things. There's geopolitical undercurrents to these things. And we just don't, I, I think sometimes we just don't get the full perspective of like, hey, they're not acting up for no reason. It's because, you know, the EU's in flux. These leaderships are changing. They want to test the new people coming in. We, we kind of lose those little nuances and then we go, Oh, why is the, the economy in flux? Well, it's things like that that we're not always talking about or even aware of, isn't it? Well, and the other thing too that's interesting about the U.S. is that so if you think about it, I mean, we have we have oceans on two of our borders, and then we have Canada to the north, and we have Mexico to the south. So, like in terms of how many neighbors that we have, we're pretty isolated. So, like on a global stage, like the U.S., like we're kind of on a cul-de-sac if you want to think <laughs> about it like that. Whereas If you go over into Europe, you're in a, like, you think about like, you know, major city, like you've got maybe like three, three feet of yard on either side of your house. And then here are your neighbors. And so you've got a lot, you've got a lot more people in a, in a relatively small space. Um, And also too, a lot of really long, complicated, complex histories there. So you're thinking about, um, take, for instance, Eastern Europe, like we were talking about earlier. I mean, my students don't remember and I barely remember, but you're still dealing with and have people who have very much a vivid memory of what it was like to live under the Soviet Union. And so you have those types of things that are still very much influencing how countries look and in some ways, what current, not necessarily what the current policies on the books are, but the um, the long and lagging effects of, of those types of institutional structures. And so it's, it's easy for us, and I say us, meaning those of us living in the United States, to forget how close people are geographically in a lot of other areas of the world, um, and particularly how big the U.S. is just in terms of land space. Um, my husband and I, for instance, we we had occasion a couple days ago to look up some Texas geography, and it was like, that city is eight hours away from that city by car, and from here to this city we're in Kentucky is 20 hours by car. I mean, 20 hours by car in Europe, I mean, you can cover country after country after country. So people seem to forget that, like, if you want to think about or it might be helpful to think about it like this. A state in the U.S. is oftentimes the size of a country in Europe. 
Right. And so as opposed to, so again, I'm, I'm in Kentucky. So I think about, okay, we've got, um, you know, Illinois, Indiana, West Virginia, Tennessee, Virginia, I'm missing a couple of states, but we have a lot of neighbors. If instead those were other countries, what we would have to do would be a lot more complicated. And so I think that sometimes that's helpful to maybe try to put things in perspective. So think about the states that are bordering you. And if instead of their governor being their governor, their governor was their president and your governor is your president. And then think about how complex, how complicated those issues would turn. Yeah. It's actually one of the things I miss about Europe because you can travel so easily. It's like, you know, it takes me five and a half hours to get from uh, West Virginia where I'm from to the North Carolina house and back. It's like, Man, from Frankfurt, that's Paris. That's you yeah. know, Prague. <laughs> a little bit, maybe a little nicer places to visit than, you know, driving through parts of northern North Carolina. No offense to, you know, Greensboro or anything. but Yeah, I know, but it's, it's a little <laughs> bit different when it's like, oh, hey, I have 90, you know, 90 minutes. I can hop on the bullet train and go from London to Paris. Yeah, or, uh, you mentioned Ryanair. People don't understand the joy of getting a Ryanair flight to another country on short notice for, you know, 30 euros or whatever. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> talk, one more thing to kind of wrap up. Uh, the migrant thing, though, when, when you looked at that, uh, economics can be such a numbers heavy thing. Uh, how do you look at something like migration and economics? How do you keep the people focused so that still because you're teaching students, those are people you're trying to appeal to a wider audience. Those are people. Economics just by its nature. That's a numbers. And that's a lot of math that I don't like anyway and have a hard time understanding. How do you keep the people focused on that? Because I, I found anything, whether it's policy or economics or political, or any, anytime you start getting really deep into numbers and things, you, you can lose track of the people and then you start going down some real dark alleys. How do you do that? How do you approach it with your students and yourself of, hey, even though this is a discipline that's very data heavy, we need to keep notice that all this data, these are people in here too. Right. And, and that can be, can be an area of difficulty because you're right. Economics can be very, very empirically heavy. And so perhaps one of the best examples of how to do this or how I'm thinking about this with migration is a current project that I'm working on with uh, Mike Kuhn, who's at the University of Tampa, and Cynthia Bansack, who's at St. Lawrence University. And what we're doing is we are looking at the impacts of border fencing on the number of deaths in terms of migrant crossings. So we're looking at the southern border of the United States, um, and actually we're looking at the Secure Fences Act. So people oftentimes think about the border wall and they think, oh, Trump, um, but it actually started much earlier than that. So we're looking at a particular act that starts under the Bush administration, what happens to the amount of pedestrian fencing, what happens to the amount of vehicle fencing, um, in particular areas, and then what happens to the number of people dying. So when they find people who've attempted to cross and have died in that process, um, how many people, and then also in what areas. And so what we're finding is that when the border wall is constructed, we're finding that the number of migrants who are dying is increasing everywhere, but is increasing more in areas where there isn't a border wall. So to break this down in a way that's, I think, easier to understand. When you have the wall going up, you would expect fewer people to try to cross there, right? Because it's harder to do. So what do people attempt to do? They attempt to cross someplace else where there isn't a wall. So this might mean that they're crossing in a desert. It might mean that they're crossing over mountains. It might mean that they're crossing into private areas or private land that Border Patrol doesn't, um, doesn't patrol. And so um, this makes sense then in terms of what we're seeing as, as far as that result of, okay, you're having people who are now trying to cross in more dangerous areas, and therefore you're having um, more people dying as, as a result. The way that we are attempting to make sure to bring this back to like a, a human focus is that because you look at the numbers and it's like, oh, okay, another, um, you know, like 21, 21 deaths per, you know, uh, I can't remember what the what the number that what the base number that we use is. And it's very easy to look at that and just see a number. But what we think about is like, okay, well, what if we compare this to something like the murder rate to major US cities? And you see that it's actually higher than those murder rates. Um, and oftentimes too, when we look at this, sometimes, though not always, we have the the names of people who died or we have some information about them. So it'll be like, oh, uh, uh, you know, a woman. 
age between 25 and 45. Um, otherwise, like unable to, to be identified. And so one of the ways that we, we try to do that and try to keep that human element is just that, is you take those numbers, you compare them to something that's, that's tangible, and then just remind people of like, hey, these are human beings. So, you know, a woman between the age of 25 and 45, that's me. Like, I'm in that cohort. Um, and then also, too, in talking about migration of having these discussions of like, well, why are people migrating in the first place? It's not because people are interested in going someplace and breaking breaking the laws of the land. It's because the circumstances that they're facing at home are bad enough that they're willing to attempt to do things like, in the case of the U.S., cross through a desert or pay a coyote thousands of dollars for the hope of getting across the border so that you can give yourself and maybe your family a shot of something that's better. Yeah, I, I found it interesting when we had the... the uh the media noise got really really loud over the the picture of the horses on the border and i was like isn't anybody curious why those are haitians on the southern border from an island country and we we kind of talked about it's like we kind of we kind of buried the lead on that's like well wait a minute why are there haitians on the mexican border crossing the river in the first place and then they don't take the step and and god we could spend three hours on french colonialization in the mess of this haiti for the last hundred years and just Mm -hmm. Talk about a country that can't catch a break. Good Lord, those poor folks. Yeah, but, poor Haiti. But just as an example, though, it's like you're talking massive amounts of recent and past history that put those people in a place that they shouldn't really be in. But yet they're there. And yet we want to discuss, you know, the optics of it. And there's no discussion of, man, there's a lot of things that went into getting those people there that don't fit folks' narratives and perceptions and priors really, really well. And, and it just, it doesn't compute with people to just stop and go, wait a minute, how did people from an island nation get on our southern border in the first place? Right. Or thinking about other types of policies. So in looking at things like um, the number of immigrants that are coming from Honduras or the number of immigrants that are coming from uh, Guatemala, uh, very recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, had an opportunity to spend some time in Guatemala City. And there was a really bloody civil war in the mid, you know, mid 1900s. So not that long ago, um, definitely within my parents' lifetime. And thinking about, well, why is it that people are, are migrating? Um, there is a well-known route through Mexico that a lot of Central American immigrants take um, the English translation is they call it the beast. Uh, it's a train that people literally get up on top of, and then they ride this train north, and it attempts to, to get in, into the United States. And if you look at the rates of violent crime, so things like assaults or sexual assaults, they're incredibly high. And yet you see people you know, clinging onto this train, uh, including people doing things like putting their children on top of this train. And I can think of nothing else to, to indicate of like how, how desperate, especially too for people who have kids, how desperate would you have to be in thinking something like, you know, there is a really good chance that this could result in injury. We could be assaulted. My daughter could be raped. And yet I'm willing to take this risk to try to enter into the U.S., this really dangerous route in order to try to have a shot at something better. And I don't think that people are looking at people who are immigrants and thinking, oh, well, they're doing this because they, you know, aren't, aren't thinking clearly or they don't love their kids as much as I do. I think of how bad would it have to be at home that I'd be willing to put my kids at such a risk to try to get them something better. And I think that that really puts it, puts it into a better perspective. Speaking of folks that got very, very desperate in a hurry, the last time I got to talk to you was uh, the Monday after uh, Kabul fell and Afghanistan was coming apart on the scenes. We were talking on live radio. You were fantastic. Thank you for helping me through that fun morning. Uh, but you've written a lot uh, about uh, the war on terror. You've written a lot about uh, some of the propaganda stuff that goes around that. You co-authored the book, Manufacturing Militarism. We, we've got some space from the Afghanistan thing now. Uh, folks have pretty much gone back to forgetting about Afghanistan, which is the history of Afghanistan. People forget about it unless you're involved. Uh, 
how would you put a bow on it now that there's been some time? We know what happened recently where uh, they talk about the drone strike where we killed the civilians, the innocent civilians, and that got, uh, I'll just call it what it was. It got whitewashed because that couldn't be anybody's fault because then we would have had to talk about what actually happened. And I've got my own opinions on that. I'll keep to myself. But you've, you've spent a lot of time on this topic, the war on terror. We have space from it now. Um, when you're talking about it now, now that Afghanistan has ended, at least for the moment for America, what, what are your thoughts on it as you continue to talk about it, you continue to lecture on it and do interviews on it? Where, where are you at here? What are we now, two months after the fact? How's it landing with you now? Um, I would say that it's probably still more of, more of the same. So one of the things that we did in the most recent book, because we hadn't, we had not yet withdrawn from Afghanistan, but the, we knew that withdrawal was going to be coming when, when the book finally went to, to its final printing. And so the preface is about Afghanistan and the Afghanistan papers and essentially how you have this disconnect between what was known by officials about what was happening in Afghanistan and what was being presented to the American public. And so I would say that the further that we've gotten out from that, the the more that we just see the the same is that you've got this big disconnect between what's being portrayed and then what was actually known at the time. Um, it is a prime example of the the folly of foreign intervention as well as attempts at nation building, because despite what it is that officials say of like nation building was never an intention in Afghanistan, that's just a bald faced lie. Um, it's, it was absolutely something that was discussed of like, well, we, we can build it back and it can, it can look better. Um, and so I think you look at Afghanistan, you look at Iraq, you look at any number of other countries in the Middle East and Africa in which the U.S. has engaged in intervention as a part of the global war on terror, um, and you see more, more of the same. You've got all kinds of cost, human, monetary, non-pecuniary, um, and ultimately the individuals who are paying the price are the people of Afghanistan. Um, what I think is really unfortunate about what's happened in Afghanistan over the last two months is exactly what you pointed out. Um, people were really upset when the withdrawal first happened. And now if you ask people like, well, what's going on in Afghanistan? Um, people have no idea. Um, if I'm like, hey, you know, there's a representative from the Taliban who's going to be meeting U.S. and EU officials later today. No idea. Um, what, you know, what kind of what's the status of humanitarian aid? And people don't know. And I think that that um, is predictable, but also in incredibly sad. Yeah, when I, I wrote about it, I, I, I used the term that, you know, what us getting out, we were washing our hands of it. Just everybody wanted to be done with it. And they just want to go back to not talking about it, uh, both policy wise, politically and uh, frankly, the American people. They just didn't want to be bothered with it anymore. And, they, and there's trauma there. And I understand that part of it. But um, I think this kind of goes to get it back to economics for just a minute where we started, though. Whether it's uh, Afghanistan, something like that, or the fiscal situation with America, there seems to be a recurring theme, which we've dealt with since the beginning of our country, is uh, we don't seem to have a lot of accountability in our government right now. And I know you're, you're, you're an economist and you talk about those things, but when it comes to things like how we treat our people and things like that, what, what do you see that we need to be working on on a practical level to get some accountability in government? Because I don't know that people are even really interested in it other than just the lip service of it, because we seem to be repeating the same mistakes over and over again with whether it's fiscal stuff, whether it's foreign policy stuff. We just don't seem to be really interested in a people as holding our government accountable unless it's something really big and bad that just hits us directly. So what what you've pointed out is really a huge question. I'm um, sorry. And give no, two no, examples, it's, please. No, it's a, it's a great <laughs> it's a great question. Um, so I'll mention before something that I, I talked about, I think probably uh, a while ago at this point is public choice economics or the economics of politics. And so ideally, and if we're talking about like the U.S., in, in a democratic society, you have checks and balances that are put in place so that voters can effectively reward or punish politicians for either doing what the voting public wants or not doing what the voting public wants. And you have similar disciplinary mechanisms in place between elected officials and people who are running government bureaus um, so again, in theory, politicians should be acting on behalf of, of their voters. Um, but in reality, we know that those checks and balances are not as strong 
as we might like them to be. So there are questions about how do we potentially fix those those issues or how do we how do we strengthen those checks and balances? There's an even broader question then of how it is that you go about structuring government so that they do the things that we want them to do, but don't do those things that we don't want them to do. Now, what we put in those two camps might look very different depending on your political uh, political idea. So for some people, stuff that government should be doing, that's a long list. For other people, that list is very short. Um, But regardless of that, we can still think about the rules under which government operates. So there's a different branch of economics called constitutional political economy or CPE. And that branch of economics is all about trying to figure out, well, what are the rules that government operates under that can try to get us those, um, those, those better outcomes, better being ones where we have government doing what we want them to do and not what we don't want them to do. So that's kind of big picture. And then practically speaking, That's another question. So there are lots of people who have all kinds of ideas about how you can make government more more effective. So there, you see people doing things like proposing term limits or universal voting or banning um, lobbying or campaign contributions and and things like that. Um, There are a lot of different ideas. Um, I don't know that we, we, well, I would say we certainly don't have anything that's like a silver bullet in terms of, hey, this will... Um, make elected officials more more accountable. Um, I do think ultimately at the end of the day that citizens have a really heavy burden that is placed upon them in order to have a um, a functioning free society. It requires people being um, demanding in terms of how much information that they demand from their government, what they consider to be acceptable, what they consider to be unacceptable. Um, and that is a very costly, costly thing. Um, there is a, a Nobel Prize winning economist by the name of James Buchanan who wrote uh, an article that's titled, I believe, um, Afraid to be Free, um, and talking about how it is an incredible amount of work um, on the part of citizens in order to live in, in a free society. And so I think if you want to talk about practical things, having people again, demanding information from their elected officials um, and then acting upon that information is is critically important. I know that's, again, not necessarily something concrete and actionable, but that's that's the best the best way I think I could answer that question at this point. Democracy dies of laziness will be a great topic that we need to delve into further down the road. Uh, Abby Hall Blanco, you are a fount of knowledge, and I've always appreciated getting to talk to you. It's nice to talk to you a little longer form, but uh, let folks know where they can find you, what you have going on with your social media and your writing and uh, your teaching. I don't know uh, what the admission standards for Bellarmine University are, but if they want to be in your economics class, I'm sure you'd be happy to have them as well. But where can folks find you? Yes, I'd absolutely love to see people in my economics classes. Um, my uh, personal website is abigailrhall.com. So there people can find uh, links to a lot of my different papers. You can find my CV um, as well as other media links and contact information if people want to get a hold of me. Um, I am also on uh, Twitter under abigail underscore all underscore R, sorry, underscore Hall, um, and also on Instagram under the uh, same uh, same handle. So people people can find me. It, does economics translate to Instagram very well? I know we, we always talk in the writing world that writing doesn't translate to Instagram really particularly well, but does economics? <laughs> One of the things that I've loved about Instagram is that if I see something that I'm like, oh, this is a really great economic concept, I can take hmm. a picture and I can put it up on Instagram. And then not only do I have something that I can put up to amuse me temporarily, but I also have a really nice repository of examples Ah. that I can use for class. You might, you might want to go trademark a photogenic economics. That might be something you want to, you know, I like that idea. I like the capitalization idea. There you go. We'll just throw that in there for free for you. But Abigail Hall Blanco, thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Absolute pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. You know, in talking about economics, Thomas Sowell wrote this. He said, the first lesson of economics is scarcity. 
There is never enough of anything to fully satisfy all those who want it. The first lesson of politics is to disregard the first lesson of economics. Maybe the lesson is that we don't really know that much about economics in the first place, and it leaves us susceptible to political influences trying to tell us what is and is not reality when it comes to economics. And our media environment isn't helping, like we discussed with Abby Hall Blanco today. The current news cycle is just terrible at things that like nuance and explanatory and things that are complicated and have deep backgrounds. And economics is very, very complicated. It's a lot of numbers. It's a very data heavy discipline. But we need to try to understand it or at least understand what is good and good and not good information when it comes to economics so that we can understand the times we live in. We need to understand where we can get good information on things like economics because, as we've discussed, it really does affect our lives. Everything you buy, everything you purchase, everything you try to do has an economic indicator attached to it. And understanding these things will keep us susceptible from not falling for all the news cycle noise when it comes to economics. There are things in the economy that we really ought to be concerned about. There are things that we are probably panicking over for no good reason. How do we discern through those things? Well, we have to keep the first rule of economics in mind. Scarcity. And the scarcity is that most of us don't have enough knowledge about it. So let's have a little bit of humility when it comes to things like economics. Find good information and not just react to everything we're being told about it. Because it is a tool. And we don't want any tool to become weaponized, especially politically especially going into a political and election season where the economy is going to be on the top of everybody's mind. Discernment must be the most important thing we have. That doesn't have to be scarce. It's something we should be abundant in, even on something complicated like economics. And one really important thing we want to keep in mind that we talked to with Abby was things like economics, things like politics. We never want to forget that we're dealing with people, not just figures, not just policies. We're all in this together. Let's never lose our humanity, especially over things like numbers and economics or migration. That'll do it for this edition of Hurt Tell. So thankful that you're with us, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on any of the podcast platforms like iTunes or Spotify, Google, Amazon, iHeartRadio. We're on all of them. Just look up Hurt Tell or my name, Andrew Donaldson. You'll be able to bring that right up. Do do us a favor, though. Almost all those platforms leave you the option to leave a comment and a rating. Please do that. It's really important. It let's other people know that our little program is worth checking out. And it also raises the visibility of Hertel so that folks can find it. So if you take a few minutes to do that, I'd really appreciate it. If you really want to help us out, put us out on your social media, share a link, let folks know that we're worth their time because our first rule here is we don't want to ever waste your time. We put a lot of effort into this. We try to have knowledgeable guests. We want to hit topics that matter. We don't want to waste anybody's time. So if you would take the moment to share, that would be great for us. We're entering into the holiday season, so we hope you and yours are doing well. Wherever you're listening to this, across the street or around the world, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. Until we talk to you again, y'all take care. All the music on Hertel is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com.